Well, Coach, welcome back. We're excited um, to have you for the inaugural crunch time. And so just a, a quick um, intro to what it is. We're going to take a look at a few different games from, I guess now technically two seasons ago with you guys. And specifically the last four to five minutes and walk through decisions, what happened, what are you thinking, strategies, all those kinds of things. And so we're really excited to have you do that with us here. To lead into it, to start, can you take us a little bit into your mindset and how you try to prepare your team for end of game situations, whatever they might be? I mean, I think it's, there's no best practices or, or, you know, magic formula. I mean, I think every team's different. Every coach is different. Um, I think we try to work in practice situations on scenarios a fair amount. Um, that could be end of game. It could be end of half. Um, but you know, one thing we've, we've tried to pay special attention to at Hopkins, especially it's something that I wanted to get better as a, as a coach at this time around at Hopkins as a head coach was just working more on situations Um, early in the season. Like as soon as we start practices, let's start working on end of half and end of game, special situations, you know, so that the team becomes familiar with things throughout the year, you know, and that could be as simple as on the second practice we're putting in, uh, an inbounds play to get the ball to your best free throw shooter uh, at the end of a game, you know? Um, and I don't think all end of game situations have to be yard down three, 2.1 on the clock side out of bounds. It could be, all right, we're playing a two minute scrimmage and blue is down three. We're playing a three minute scrimmage. Blue is up eight, you know? And then from those small scrimmages, essentially like they're kind of crunch time scrimmages, as you're describing, them, you know, just, situations present themselves and you know you you can call timeouts get the team on the board over on the sideline and 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 have those become familiar settings for your players as you as you're in a practice setting coach when you're when you're going to do these kind of um late game situation the two minutes three minutes are you taking one team and just kind of focusing on coaching them like as far as getting out getting your reps that's a good question. I, I usually give one team to one assistant and the other team to another assistant. And then I like, a, like a real head coach, I interject myself when I want to, you know, it's uh-huh. uh, a super, super head coach move. Like I got this one guys. Thanks. Like, <laughs> but yeah, the pro from Dover's here. Thanks. Uh, you know, like I, I think you can learn a lot from your team as those situations unfold sometimes. So I think, not interjecting myself all the time and letting assistants do things, letting them try out things, letting situations unfold sometimes without a ton of direction to your team. And then, okay, let's run that back now, or let's run that back the next day. Let's review what we did. Let's watch it on film. Let's, why is that good? Why is that bad? Um, What would you do differently? Let's run it back and see how it plays out this time. You know, and I, I yeah. think you can learn a lot from your team just seeing how they handle things. And then that allows them to go through the process of understanding the situations. Okay, now I understand. I tried this. It didn't work. I understand what coach is saying that this would be a better option. And let's let's go through that. Coach, one more follow-up from my end before we jump into the film here. When you're working on these early season, preseason, how much of it is just like basic late game situation? Like, hey, we're down. We need to start trapping. Um, or, you know, more of like a philosophical way of playing in late games and how much of it is like unique things. Like you need a home run pass to get a three with 2.1 seconds or, you you know, like the differentiation between the end of game. I think, situations. It's, I think it's both, you know, okay. I, I, I know that's kind of hedging, but I think you need to have things installed. Like you need to have, I, I'm a bigger believer in putting those things in earlier in the season is always better. That way you can just rep it out and have the guys be like, I've done this 30 times in practice. I know. And why are we calling this? Okay. Why are we doing that? Okay. Yeah. But then also like, we don't press a ton. We, we didn't press a lot last year, but we start working on our press day one. 
Um, because at the very least, you want to have that thing repped out. So in those tight games, your guys are not panicked and thinking like, all right, well, we only press when this is going on. And I haven't done, if they've pressed every day of the year, you might not use it in certain games, but they're going to have reps. They're going to have comfortability and they're going to have a belief that they, that you know what you're doing in a crunch time situation, as opposed to we never press in practice but now we have to. And then is there that belief that the press is really going to work? You know, so I yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to dive in first to your January 11th game uh, against Washington. Could you maybe just I guess we're going to jump in right about um, four and a half minutes left in the game. Could you give us a little bit of background on leading up to that point? We were down by nine. Yeah. And it wasn't. We weren't playing well, and they were playing well. They 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 were playing. You know, they give up. They were giving us some problems. They were having a good day shooting. You know, they they were a team that was a streaky shooting team, and they were shooting very well. They were hitting some really tough twos on us. Styles make fights. You know, and they they present us some problems here and there with their their roster makeup, and um, I'd like to think we do too. But at this point, they were getting the better of us, and um, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I would not be, you know, misrepresenting things to say that people felt like we were in dire straits at that point. You're down eight with 445. Still a lot of game left, but you obviously felt at this point you needed to pick up the pressure to, to do something different. Correct. You know, change the rhythm, um, not allow them to necessarily run 30 seconds of shot clock, get the ball out of primary ball handlers. And at this point in the game, down eight with 444, there's there's time, but you have to start taking calculated risks now. It, it's it's a non-trapping press, right? You're just trying to get up, turn them, put a little bit of pressure, where later you're, you're trying to trap, or were you trying to trap there and you guys just, just didn't? It's run and jump the whole time, and, okay. and they just did, they didn't read it. They I, I mean, it's a, it's all read-based. Like, I'm not telling them when to go or anything. They, they just didn't feel like they had a trap that presented itself. And, we talk about that with the team a lot. Like if, if there's no trap to be had, you know, you can, you can make a call as a coach that says like, Hey, we're going to force the trap no matter what we weren't in that call yet. Coach at this point, offensively, what's kind of your, what are you communicating to the guys? What are you trying to do to get, you know, get back into the game? You're going to have to obviously get stops and score. The big thing we did here is we went small. If you can see we're playing Delaney at center now, and he's normally our point guard. So yes. we're we're running Princeton offense with our with our point guard at center right now. And the idea there is right there. You know, he's he's a great passer and we're just creating space and the ability to play in space with with shooting and, and a lot of ball handling at that point. Coach, my question with that, is that something you, you guys practice often then moving him to the five? We had practiced it very sparingly. Um, we had some ways we have some calls to put him at the five, you know, in, into our, in our offense, in our base offense. We had not done it a ton. And this is where coaches have to be honest with themselves and, and say, having a player or players who can play multiple positions, or even if they don't play those positions, they understand them and being able to on the fly say, we're going to do this. And then that player being able to do it, like that's more important than being a good coach, like having a player who can, and having other players who understand, having high IQ guys to be able to do some things on the fly that you haven't worked on a ton, that matters a lot. And I guess right to your point about the run and jump stuff, you guys, this next possession here, get a great run and jump, get the trap and then steal and then miss layup, but two free throws here. What are things you're trying to communicate to your guys right now? Now we're under four minutes. You're still down. What are you, what are you communicating to him? Uh, right there, I'm, I'm telling him uh, some concepts we want him to play out of while he's playing at the center spot. Okay. So without, I guess, without getting into specific stuff, they're running or, or matchups, you'd mentioned that they were just a little bit of a matchup 
issue, especially this game, kind of looking back at this now, I mean, what specifically was giving you guys fits? Some things specific to us is we were not we were not very active in gaps and shrinking the floor in this game. We were we were a little hugged up to our man early. We were, you know, not super tight in terms of just rotations and help. And then, um, you know, they they are generally a pretty small team. They don't they don't play a ton of minutes with traditional centers. So, you know, all those things combined kind of challenged us. One of the things watching this coach that interests me is Delaney maybe not being in that spot all the time, but his defender is not used to being in that spot. And you could see there he's having a hard time guarding a DHO, yeah. which is interesting. And we do, and like I said, we do we do put him in that spot. We'll run, you know, we we kind of stole it from Richmond, you know, a way to get a different player into the Princeton high post. But we had not really practiced where he's the trail in our wide uh, five out break. And that's okay. where it became like on the fly showing, that, and, and he's really, really smart. So he understood like how it worked. So you make free throws to go down five with three and change. And it didn't seem like the press was as important to run and jump and get a bunch of traps. Is that something just yeah, happened? Correct. Sure at, at five, at five, it was like, all right, like if we get a stop and a score here, now all of a sudden it's a three or a two point game. So like, let's, Let's pull back the pressure a little bit. Getting Delaney to that elbow and he's obviously a problem um, at those spots. Yeah, we were running a lot of uh, handoff action because it just presents those, those keeper opportunities for him. That was a really good run and jump by Ethan Bartlett there, I thought. A little bit of a breakdown, but you, you, again, you gotta take some risks in these situations. So now you're down back eight, kind of taking some risks, 220. They call a timeout, I believe, after they yes, score. They yeah, yeah. So what is kind of the mindset of the coach as why you would call a timeout after you've scored? Well, I think, you know, I think, I think setting that if, if there's something that's giving your D a problem, addressing that and talking about how we're going to guard it, what we're going to do to stop that bleeding. Those are the, those are the conversations about tactics. Yeah. A lot of times it's to get a certain player in there or to switch a matchup, you know, but also Patrick, I think um, one thing that's interesting is there was a study a few years ago about NBA timeouts, and perhaps this doesn't apply very well to college, but timeouts tend to skew towards the defense, honestly. It, they, they, they tend to favor the defense coming out of timeouts. How much of what the other team may or may not do kind of factors into what tactically you will, you will do? I think those, you know, like when you call a timeout, those those quick coaches huddles are really important to be productive in there. And, you know, because I've, I've been really fortunate to have good assistants who will notice something and say, hey, this is something we can take advantage of right now, you know, mm -hmm. or, hey, on film, this is something they like to do late game or we got to remind them of this, you know, those kind of things. And also you can get an offensive substitution in as well. You know, I think. Sometimes that's the downside of calling a defensive timeout is you're allowing the offense to make a sub that might help them on offense as well. You guys were having a lot of success going your elbow with Delaney, letting him go to work. You run something a little different. Can you explain why? Down eight, 218 to play. You cannot live exclusively on twos. You just can't. Co Coach, on this set, which is interesting to me, is you put Delaney as the the screener and, and then setting the flare and it looks like you have maybe more of your uh, potentially traditional four or five on the weak side yeah. not in the action what's the thought of having delaney be the guy setting these screens uh he knows he knows every position on the floor okay <laughs> so, <laughs> like hey uh delaney's gonna know what to do as the five man in this set because okay. he just hey, he's very good at that got it okay perfect well, great set here. To Pat's point, you score, hit the three down five, and now you call a timeout. So can you talk a little bit about 
that timeout call and what you're trying to communicate then? We're going to sub in a defensive lineup that we really like. We're going to talk about our press here in which we go uh, with our face press, trying to, trying to, you know, face guard their primary ball handler and get the ball into somebody else's hands. Um, and then we're going to talk about what kind of run and jumps we're looking for, whether we're initiating that, even if it doesn't present itself in an ideal fashion, and then what we're running as we come back, make or miss. Okay. Is that a good, is that the trap angle spot you guys are looking for or no? no. no. Okay. So we're, in, we're, we're, we're coming out of that uh, timeout and we're saying no matter what we're running and jumping. Okay. So okay. He's he, and I think Braden Johnson does a really good job here of, you can kind of see him eyeing it up the entire time. And we just never get that kid out of control or turned, uh, which a, a good job by him of, of, uh, bringing the ball up in the middle third of the floor. But, I, and then I think Braden does a good job. I mean, it's not ideal because he's staring. You always, you don't want to trap when a guy's staring down the trap, but we, we're, we're gonna go. I don't care what, we have to go. That's our call. And he does go in a trap area. So this is a pretty good job of trapping in a good spot, even if it's not perfect. Oh, and then actually we went over there. We were trying to get them to, we trapped off of the one player who's a bad free throw shooter. We were trying to run over there and foul him as soon as he touched the ball. We didn't get it done. Okay, coach, that's interesting. Can you explain that? You know, over two minutes left starting to foul. Yeah, I mean, like just just points per expected expected value of possession. You know, he's, it, it, you know, depending on whether you're in the one and one or the two shot, depending what, I mean, he's a below 50% free throw shooter. Okay. So just feeling like if we foul him and they're in a one and one or even in a two shot foul, like we're going to be well below point uh, one point oh points per possession. You're probably more at like a point. You're probably more at like a point five five or a point six expected value. So now they get into some Spain pick and roll. Yeah, I thought we did a pretty good job of switching it, and then um, they drove us hard off of it. That was, yeah, you know, just got us, got us. We did a good job of communicating the switch, and we just weren't great in our closeout. They drove us pretty hard off it. He's a good player. Okay, so you guys are going back to a similar set, obviously giving them some fits. Well, you know, we hit a three off it earlier, so that's a really good job by Carson of understanding that they're going to be. I think his man slipped a little bit too, but I, I really like this press by us um, to be able to get into a face guarding press off of a make. Good job by Braden Johnson. And then, you know, they throw it long, but this is, I think this is a good risk to take at that point. Um, they they burn us on it, but the risk reward there is, that's a very tough play to, to complete. And we also, um, we get them to shoot in two seconds. So we're, we're playing a little bit of the, the, the clock game there. A, a big time play to get you guys to, I think within four now. Another timeout by you. So. Can you talk us through this timeout? Yeah, you know, we've been in a press, but we haven't turned them over. You know, I I thought we had a good run and jump. I I think in that situation, we just saw, like, we, we, we tell our guys, don't, don't be so hesitant. It, don't worry about getting beat long there too much. Um, you got to take some risks. But we haven't turned them over. So what are some things that we can do to adjust that we think are just going to, you know, create a better chance to get a turnover? Not, again, not a terrible, yeah. not a terrible press there. You know, Delaney closes on that ball pretty well. It, it, it kind of like a pass interference right there. Yeah, um, doesn't go our way. But again, we we just didn't use any time. Yeah. So I think overall, like our press hasn't gone exceedingly well, but we have not allowed them to run clock. Coach, at this point, you're down four with a minute. Are you starting to play out some scenarios in your head as far as where it could be going? Or is it just, you gotta just be in the moment, you gotta be reacting to what presents itself? Or how are you trying to prepare yourself? As he's shooting the first free throw, I have, uh, I'll call a guy over and talk about, hey, if he makes one, we're down 
five, we want to like think about this. If he misses both, we're down four. Think about that because down five and down four are very different. Down five and down four are hugely different. It does. This does work out for you. The press. There's a foul, but he he does miss both of them. So no time comes off the clock. Yep. Ball back. That's where going small helps because he's just got a ton of space to operate. It really gives him some lanes. For yeah. sure. Coach, he scores. You're down two now with a minute. And you're still up pressing and in, in, in your, I think it looks like your face press. Is that something, I mean, obviously you wanted them to keep the pressure up. But at that point, are you thinking at any point, well, let's not press so much over the top because now it's a one that's possession where basketball, game. That's where basketball is hard. It's not football where you get to stop after every play and set things up. Like you almost have to approach this, I think, with the worst case scenario. We're not going to score. So you have to have the press ready to go because it's way easier to pull that press off in the moment. You can't put it back on. Yeah. Great rotation there off the run and jump by Carson James. Really good rotation to, to get up there and take away an advantage. You know, so Braden Johnson goes over and, and traps. Joey Kern runs out diagonal and Carson James rotates up to support, which is huge. Washington will take the timeout here. At this point, Coach, what is your timeout situation? And what are you setting up offensively out of this timeout? You only have one, so yeah. hopefully get something out of flow or off the break here. Try to get a two for one, essentially. It doesn't work perfectly, but we're going to get something quick and then, you know, be able to use that timeout if we need a, a last second, a last second uh, possession. Okay, so he gets one of two. Tough call here. It, it appears, it's hard to see from this angle, but it seems like you definitely think it went off of yeah. uh, him. I, I do. I still do, actually. Yeah, I was trying to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this is this is my question to you, though. It's a bad call. How, though, you have to then express the bad call to the ref and then get back to coaching your team very quickly. Yeah. Um, you do a good job of it here, but um, I guess it seems like sometimes coaches will get lost in just arguing the call and forget they've got a, like you get over it pretty quickly here. Where it's where having ADD, it's where having ADD is an advantage. <laughs> right. I just, I just like moved on to the other thing because that's the way my mind works. It's not because I'm like so disciplined or anything like that. <laughs> You've already forgotten. Down five under 30 are you saying we, we want to hunt a three first or are you still telling them if you can get to the rim get to the rim you want first best okay one you're i'm okay with pressuring the paint for a kick out three i'm okay with a quick layup you know the less time is on the clock the more a three is going to be needed but honestly like I, I think i sent you that thing the other day of like when announcers say you need a three and when you really need a three are right. you know like if you're down five and it's under 30, you're going to need a quick three at some point. And I, I just don't believe this. People keep on saying like, ah, oh, you can get a quick two here. Well, if you take a quick two here, now you're down three and you foul. If they make both, you're in the exact same situation with seven less seconds. If you make the three and you foul, now you at least have gained a point. So threes here are really, really valuable. And obviously a great shot. And then here's your, I believe this is your last time out. Yeah, because now I think we're, we're, we want to set up our press and we want to set up, okay, how many traps are we going before we foul? Are we going to foul right away to really play the clock game? If they're up this much, if they're up that much, what are we looking for? All of those scenarios you got to go through at this point. Okay, coach, specifically yeah. now, this situation, basically 20 seconds left, you're down to, assuming you're going to try to get a steal and or trap, and then you're going to have to foul. Correct. How do you tell your guys, one, to go trap, and then working on fouling in this situation, if need be? I know we'll, we'll run the tape here and you'll see what happens, but how well, do you work on where, that? I think that's where working on pressing from the start of practice helps because we're, like, we, we saw that clip earlier of, of Carson James supporting the the jump, the, 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 the run and jump. Yeah. So having guys understand how to rotate behind traps so that you're never like, I think what happens 
sometimes to teams is they trap and the rest of the team is very far back the floor. Yeah. So any pass to a safety now, the rest of the team is playing catch up. They have to sprint 30 feet to go foul that guy. And then the ball is always quicker than the defense. You know, now you're able to hopefully arrive and steal that pass. If not, you're you're able to arrive and foul immediately. Okay, if you can run this back, actually, the other thing we did in this timeout, we wanted to make sure we got a trap. And Coach Hernandez, actually, we have never run this exact press before until right now. We lined up in a one-two-two matchup because we wanted to force them up the floor and make sure we got a trap. And we felt he he had the good idea to go zone one-two-two matchup to to just put us in a better position to trap. Coach, that's interesting. Why did you think that was better than just your straight man? And well, number one, it's just a, it's a different look. But as you can see, like Braden Johnson's here, twenty three, and he's just eating up this space, you know. And then you got your back line here, and we and we walked through it in the timeout of, hey, it's a matchup, but you want to be here and you want to make them run up into the trap area. We really wanted them to catch coffin corner, and it's not go, it's not necessarily going to work. But it, it's it was a very I thought it just was a very good idea you know yep. of and then we, and then here's the other thing we've never done it so like there's very little chance that they've actually thought about having to prepare for it against us and was that a read by the guy who gets the steal or were you telling him a the opposite he's yeah gonna, we, 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 we talked about we, so, so based out of the one two two we had the exact same rotations on the trap so we we talked about that here's where the, here's where okay. we want the trap to happen and we talked to Braden and tommy about whoever's not in the trap you're you're supporting and and Braden does a great job here of it he just runs through it like and that's a drill we do really starting the first couple days of practice just how to trap and run through and support Now, I, I would I would assume <clears throat> I go back to our question earlier about the press on and the press off. Are you trying to tell them to stay on or to get back? Or, you know, do you remember you tie and you guys are, are still up pressuring? Well, again, it's, it goes back to the same thing. Like, you don't know if you're going to score. So, right. like, I'd rather I'd rather be overly aggressive. I'd rather be really aggressive here and then start screaming at them like, don't trap, don't trap. Um, they take a quick shot. And you guys actually get nice block by Tommy. Yeah, and a really good drive here. Yeah, he slips. I actually, I love. That's a great look by Carson James for the flip back, um, and and I love it. it. Unfortunately, he slips a little bit and it doesn't get to him. But I love that idea, that concept of driving it and looking back to the top for that shot. You know, we didn't go down, but as you talked about earlier, like just feeling the momentum and things like that. You know, we do we go on to win it in overtime, which is it was a, it was a great win, man. Like it was a, it was a really great win. All right, coach. So, um, kind of now zooming back out from your win with Washington, I'd like to know what you took as a staff from that win, which then you know we'll get into some games going forward in the year. What you took for out of that victory? A couple things. I think that was the first game where we thought. You know, when we're in, when we're in droughts, a small ball lineup with Delaney as your, as your, you know, ostensibly your five is a viable option. You know, um, I think it's like a lot of things like in theory, like small ball or whatever, it, it can work, but until you see it in action, you don't know what it's really going to look like. So I think as a change of pace, we were like, oh, this could be pretty good, you know, and you and you start to think like this might have a place in the future for us. You know, the other thing was that that was not the first game where we had come back and won that year, you know, and I think that it was one of those things where you started to feel as a coaching staff, or at least I know I started to feel and then we started to talk about it. This team believes they can win these games. 
And that's a real thing. You know, it's a real thing to have 